Hey, Slingers, welcome to episode 152, Writing Like a Boss with Ben Hale. We're going to be talking to Ben Hale, a prolific writer, uh, and he is a very busy guy. We're going to be talking to him about how he manages to get everything done, despite being one of the busiest guys I know. So stick around. That interview is coming up. This episode of the Word Slinger Podcast is brought to you by draft to digital Convert your manuscript, distribute it online, and get support the whole way at DraftToDigital.com. It's the Word Slinger Podcast, where story matters. Build your brand, write your book, redefine who you are. It's all about the story here. What's yours? Now, here's the guy who invented pants optional, Kevin Tomlinson, the Word Slinger. Word Slinger. Hey, thanks for sticking around. Now, you may have noticed things are a little different on the Word Slinger podcast. All of a sudden, I mean, just all of a sudden, um, here's how things are working out. I am, uh, at the moment, reformatting the show. But uh, Since I added both um, a YouTube version and an audio version, uh, things have been a little different. So if you're watching this on YouTube, I'll try to look at you every now and then. If you're, if you're looking at me and I'm looking off, it's because I'm used to doing this uh, sort of thing, not quite you know, looking at a camera. So I hope you're enjoying uh, everything I've done so far. I just had to do a little bit of a reformat. I, um, it's, just, it's just gotten too difficult to try to uh, balance everything. I was basically producing uh, two different episodes each week in a uh, limited time frame. Uh, juggling a lot of different stuff on top of that. So I'm, I'm kicking it around to a, a slightly different, uh, format this time. So I hope you don't mind. Um, now this week I'm talking with Ben Hale. He's a good friend of mine. I've, I've hung out with him at a couple of conferences now. Uh, it really is a shame that it took this long to get the guy on the show. <laughs> Cause we, we had a, uh, we had, we've had a lot of conversations and we, we, uh, we agree on a lot of things philosophically, uh, but you know, most important, <clears throat> Ben is just this great guy. He's just this, he's somebody you definitely want to know, want to have in your life. Uh, he's inspirational. He's, uh, he's the kind of, he's the kind of friend you just want to have. Now, and he is incredibly busy. The guy has everything you can imagine going on in his life. He's, um, he's doing things like, you know, go, he's, he's pursuing a master's degree. His wife is also pursuing a master's degree. They may be done by now. Um, they uh, they have their kids that they're raising. They have uh, his writing career that he's managing. Uh, you know he's writing uh, multiple books at a time here. He's he's just got a, he's got the kind of jam packed schedule you would expect from um, from you know your average wordslinger. <laughs> so he's been he's kicking it around. So you know we're gonna get into a little bit of what what he's doing, how he's managing this stuff, how he's keeping things on track. Um, some interesting, uh, some interesting conversation in this one. So you're definitely going to want to stick around for that. Um, I got some industry news and things that you're going to want to stick around for after the interview. I'm changing the format on that a little too. Um, you know, there's some subtle things happening here that you may not even notice or pay attention to, but I am definitely changing, uh, changing how the show is put together. We're going to see how this works. I'm going to refine as I go. This is part of my iterative, uh, lifestyle, my <laughs> my the iterative process by which i live my life uh and uh in a future episode i'm thinking i'm gonna i'm gonna actually uh expand on that cover that as a topic so look look for this stuff okay and uh we'll, we'll talk about that we got some other things coming up uh i hope you enjoy this episode i hope you enjoy the new format be sure to let me know in comments in emails that sort of thing i'll see you all after the interview hope you enjoy this fantastic interview with my good friend, Ben Hale. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Now, uh, I, here's the deal. I go to a lot of uh, author conferences. In particular, uh, for the past few years, I've been to the Smarter Artist uh, Conference. That's put on by the guys who did the show formerly known as Self-Publishing Podcast. I, I forget what they call it now. Uh, they're rebranding. But I met this guy a couple of years ago, and uh, there's some pretty amazing things associated with this story. We'll get into that in the interview. But I'm talking to Ben Hale. He is uh, he's the author of all kinds of things, uh, a lot of fantasy and, and uh, some great fiction. But also, uh, he co-authored a book with a former guest of the show, 
uh, called, and what's the, what was the title of the book again, Ben? I, I completely blew it out of my brain. Write Like a Boss. Write Like a Boss, which I should have known because you guys, that's what you guys do. So uh, author of Write Like a Boss, co-author of Write Like a Boss, Ben Hale. Thanks for being on the show, man. I appreciate you being here. Thank you. I, I'm really excited to be here. Um, I know I've, Kevin introduces everyone, but I'm just going to say I'm a huge fan of Kevin. I think he's awesome, so I'm excited to be here. You're such a kiss up. <laughs> I prefer a good friend. That's what I prefer. Good friend. You are a good friend. And, uh, you know, we, I've really enjoyed, you know, we met, I think it was about two years ago now, right? Mm-hmm. About that? Yeah, um, two years ago. Yeah, man. And yeah, I'm not surprised you don't remember that. I'm not surprised that you remember the, probably the exact date, possibly the exact moment to the second uh, that we met, considering uh, your, you know, your skill with memory. Because the first we, time I met, met in the hotel restaurants, did we really? Do you, uh-huh. know, you really do recall exactly where we met? It was the first night, and um, I was just kind of meeting a bunch of different people, and I, I could be wrong, but that's what I I remember because I remember when we got there the next morning, the first day I already knew you, so I I think we met in the restaurant the, the yeah. night before the event. I can I can believe it. Yeah, I can believe it. Yeah. So Ben did something. I'm going to, I'm going to tell the story and then you can correct me on everything I get wrong. And then we won't, we won't harp on it for the rest of the time necessarily. But uh, Ben did something at the, uh, that first conference. And I think you regretted it by the next conference. (laughs) I I don't, I I think um, it's, it was one of those moments that you look back and feel really proud because you did something that you felt was beyond your ability. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I don't regret it for a moment. It was one of the best things I've ever done. I feel well, like. just to, just to clue everybody in, there were a couple hundred people at the, uh, at the first con at that first smarter artist summit. Um, it was an epic magical conference. This was before I was with day to day. So I was there as an author. Mm-hmm. Um, but Ben actually took the time and the trouble to commit everyone's name to memory and then on the final day of the conference, he stood up and, and named everybody and usually included some little detail uh, about them. So, and that impressed everybody, of course. And then you had to do it again the next year. <laughs> it, did. Um, it was, I mean, before, anyone might be thinking like, oh, he's got a photographic memory or anything. I don't. Um, I had to actually go meet them and connect with them and, and uh, memorize their name because I met them. It wasn't just memorizing names and then go up and list out the names i knew yeah. who they were and um the video's on my youtube channel so if you go to youtube yeah. and just search ben hale smarter artist you can see both the first video from the first year with 150 people and the next year with 250 people yeah yeah so, and then and I it, retired. you bring up and then you retired <laughs> <laughs> but you bring up and, and here's the reason why it's remarkable it's, it, it's remarkable that you remembered it all it's remarkable that you did that as a feat what's more remarkable to me is um the reason you did it here's my interpretation of your reason maybe you have something else entirely but you cared enough that you said something in that first one and i tr- i'm completely misquoted you by the time i talked about it on uh Facebook, but it was something along the lines, I'll paraphrase and then you, fi- you fix it, uh, that everyone deserved to be known. I, that gosh, I've already read it. Yeah, you, I said that the second year, is- that you deserve to be remembered. Right, right. Yeah. That, that's very, I, it, despite the fact that I completely butchered that, very meaningful to me. <laughs> uh, very inspirational. Which is one of the reasons I've, I've wanted to get you on the show for quite a while. I don't know why we never connected. I, I don't know why we haven't either because we, um, I count you as, as one of my best friends from the conference. Um, Good, man. I, 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 fun, I and there was that. probably 10 that I remember thinking these are the ones that I really like, either on a personal level or a professional level, whatever reason. And you were on that list. And I remember thinking, like, I really like Kevin. I like what he he stands for you and uh, what you like to do and how you communicate it. I was like, I really like this guy. And I, so, I honestly um, feel oh. like you represent um, the way you operate, the way you handle yourself in these things represents what I, I think of as being part of the best of the indie author community, you know, oh, thank you. and, and uh, you, you really do represent that your, your ideals and, and the, uh, the things you, the way you talk to people, the way you interact with people, 
I really feel like that is a good example for the indie author community. And, and uh, so I appreciate it, man. And I, you know, I told you this at the last car, I told you this, you know, a couple of weeks ago that, you know, you're somebody I actually do admire. I do admire what you have done as much as who you are. Um, so, you know, you're a, you're, you're a heck of an example. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> so now let's talk a little, uh, and I'm sure that'll come back up, but let's talk a little bit. Let's first jump in because you, you co-authored Write Like a Boss with a former guest of the show, Andre Quarter, whom I love, uh, is another remarkable person. Um, tell me a little bit about that book and why Write Like a Boss? Why is that the title? So um, first off, Write Like a Boss started because Andre and I met and we both believed the same thing that making the transition from like a hobbyist writer to a professional author was difficult. And both of us had made that transition a while ago. And, and uh, we thought that that was a really hard thing to do, but specifically her and I both believe that anyone can do it. And so that belief and talking about that belief and that shared ideal um, kind of sparked the idea to write a book that would show authors how to do it, make that transition. So write like a boss, the whole idea was you can write, but to write like a boss means that you're turning yourself into the boss of a business. And okay. that, that's the whole concept. And anything you can do like a boss, like you own it, like you control it, like you're a master of that specific facet. I mean, you can vacation like a boss or um, network like a boss. There's a, you know, there's a million things that you can do with that same level of professionalism and expertise. And in this regard, we wrote write like a boss and then publish like a boss and then market like a boss. And so these three books was kind of how to really up your level and expand your knowledge base so that you can mm. basically become a full time six figure author and, and go after it, which is what she and I were able to do. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's one of those, so there are everyone who gets into this, uh, everyone pay, who's paying attention to a show like this one, everyone who tunes into the Wordslinger podcast, self-publishing podcast, any of those shows, or uh, who reads a book like Write Like a Boss, um, they are thinking about what you just said. Like they want to get to that level where they're making six figures, they're, you know, they're able to do this full time. This is their, their career. Um, so what are, Without, we don't have to spoil the book or anything, uh, but you know, what are some steps that the author takes to get to that level? I mean, I, my own journey to this point has been um, weird and uh, all over the place. And sometimes I feel like I can't offer solid advice because of that. Uh, but you and Honoré, you guys actually went and structured this whole thing. So what, you know, what are some of the early steps in that process? Um, the first, I mean, it, it basically comes down to a couple of key elements and, and we go into details on how to move this forward. But the first thing is, is that you have to understand that writing is only one facet of a uh, writing business. Yeah. And so it's much larger than that. And you have to write differently than you would if you're just a hobbyist. If you're a hobbyist, you write because you want to write because the words want to come out of you and they drive you forward and you, that's great. Right. But when you, when it's your business, you, push yourself to write better, to write more, to write more frequently, um, to write a story that will connect with a certain audience. And so you start to write a little different than you would if it's just a hobby. Mm -hmm. And so those two things put together means that you keep pushing yourself and building this, this framework that will become your business that you want to have in the long term. Yeah. And yeah. so write like a boss focuses on the writing elements how to write, um, how to become a better writer, how to uh, write to connect with an audience, uh, how to push yourself as a writer. And it gets all the way down to the nitty gritty, like how to improve your, how to improve your sentence structure mm -hmm. and gets a little bit broader, how to create a mindset that will help push you forward year over year so that you can be moving in that direction. You and, uh, you and Honoré are, um, in, in, in some ways you're very much alike in other ways in the style of writing you both do. Now I know Honoré has talked to me numerous times about wanting to write fiction. Uh, she's got some ideas. 
but you, oh, sorry about that. You are primarily a, uh, a fiction author, uh-huh. uh, while she, on the other hand, is primarily a nonfiction author. Were there any conflicts there that you guys had to resolve in the uh, sort of the approach to writing as a business? Um, surprisingly, not really. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I shouldn't say surprisingly, but I mean, I went into this prepared. I, I've had other authors ask me if I wanted to co-write, and I, I just felt uncomfortable about it and didn't didn't move forward in that direction. But with Honoré, when we got to talking, our perspectives were so in alignment right, that when right. we started writing, it just it just kind of came together. And yeah. uh, I mean, we wanted to show people that you could make this jump. And so, so that idea kind of just smoothed anything over that would have been a problem. Uh, everything from our writing styles to what we were trying to say, we outlined the book and then each of the books, and then one of us would take the first stab and write half of it and just write on whatever we wanted the topic. And then the other person responded to it and filled in holes and wrote. So like in the first one, my, there's a chapter called write fiction, like a boss. And I wrote most of that chapter. And then there's a chapter, write nonfiction like a boss. And she wrote most of that chapter. And so it just came together. It worked really, really well. Um, In the book, if you use like a Kindle Fire, each one Mm -hmm. of us has our own color, our text. And so it's almost like a conversation that you jump into and you can see my writing responding to her. So like she would say something and say, oh, I really like that idea. I wouldn't just move forward. Oh, that's Talked interesting. About it. The book is written, yeah. and that's just the way that we talked, and then the way the book was written. And it feel I've had many people. And this was intentional, but many people say they read it, and it felt like they were sitting in on a conversation with Honoré and I, just right. listening to us talk about it, which was kind of a unique approach, and it just really came together well. Yeah, that's uh, I like that approach too because um, co-authoring has been something is very it's very difficult for me you know, and, and maybe it's ego. Uh, <laughs> um, I've co-authored a couple of books, uh, two or three books, uh, mostly with my, my good friend, Nick Thacker. Uh, I think I could probably co-author nonfiction quite a bit easier than fiction. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've just never quite attempted it. Um, but I do like that approach that it's a conversation and I like the fact that it makes it much more personal. So that was it sort of a, uh, one of you made your statement, the other one actually, did you actually respond as if, you were in like a, a chat with that person? Yeah, it, it wasn't intentional. She took the first stab, wrote the first 15,000 words, and then she sent it to me um, and basically just wrote whatever she wanted to on, on the various topics we'd outlined. And so yeah. she sent it to me and I started writing and there was a, a comment that she'd made early on. And I, I thought in my head, that's awesome. You know, we didn't talk about this before, but I, I'm glad that you brought this up. And instead of just thinking it and then just moving on in the topic like lecture style, I wrote that thought in yeah. and I really liked how it felt. And so I, I called her up and said, are you okay if we do this? And she was like, this sounds awesome. And so we just started, uh, it just kept going. And then she started responding to mine. And I, when I sent it back to her, then she started threading in comments and it just became like that. And so it was intentional, but it, it, did seem to connect really well with the readers that are reading because it doesn't feel like the book's talking at you. Yeah. It feels like we're talking with you. It's like a partner. Yes. Which is like uh, a lot of Honoré's stuff feels like that uh, from the very beginning, you know, all the way back to uh, uh, prosperity for writers. I, yeah. I, it feels like you have a, you have a partner in that, that aspect of the business. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And that's what, I mean, the truth is, is as writers, we're all, struggling to push ourselves forward and when we connect with other writers it helps us push forward we believe in ourselves a little bit more we believe that other people believe in us and that helps us to to push ourselves when life is crazy and things are hard and we're distracted but that thought that hey this person thinks i can do it it helps tremendously yeah 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 i i absolutely agree with that um you, you, okay, you are among, I, I've talked to a handful of people in my life that I felt were somehow miraculously uh, better at managing a, a, a wealth of, uh, I say wealth because you get so much out of it, a wealth of um, opportunities and uh, things going on in their life. I, I hate to use uh, 
multitasking. I, I don't like the term because I don't believe that's what we do. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't multitask. Yeah, you don't multitask. You do, I say it again. I focus. You focus. But you, you focus and you do a lot. And you, you've got so many things going on, dude. I always talk, I always, people always ask me how I get everything done. And I say, well, I pretend like I'm Ben Hale or Michael <laughs> Ron. <laughs> but so you, man, you've got, you've got grad school. You, well, you give me the list because you've got so, you've got your books, you've got grad school, you've got this thing you co-authored with, with Honoré, so, um, family. <laughs> yeah. So first off, I have six kids yeah. and, uh, and that's a lot. <laughs> that, that's yeah. That's my five. Just turned eleven. Five more than I think I can handle. <laughs> yeah, it, I just my oldest just turned eleven. So as of a, before a couple weeks ago, it was ten and under. My youngest was one. My oldest was ten, and it, so they're all little. That means a lot of noise, a lot of chaos, um, sometimes crying on my part. I'm just kidding. That's, that's... <laughs> um, my my wife is amazing, and she's incredible. Uh, we work together as a team. We manage a lot together. Uh, but on top of the six kids last year, I wrote 600,000 words. Yeah. So, um, the equivalent of six, 400 page novels, give or take. Yeah. And, uh, they were in three different genres. Uh, and on top of that, my wife and I are both in master's degrees. So we're both in grad school. And I mean, even when I say it now, and I've, I've said it to a number of people like at the conference and people be asking what was going on and I'd say some of these things and it sounds crazy, but I mean, I don't stay up until two o'clock in the morning, not very often. Um, I, I get off at five o'clock every day uh, and I have time with my family until seven and then I go back and do schoolwork and homework if I need to. But generally speaking, I get most of my schoolwork done during the day. Yeah. And the reason for that is because, uh, this is going to be a long answer, I apologize, but it no. starts a little bit further back. When I first started writing full time, it was a challenge to get 2,000 words a day. That was my initial goal five years ago when I was writing full time. My goal was 2,000 words a day and I didn't hit it. It was really, really hard to write 2,000 words a day consistently. Yeah. Uh, there were so many distractions and I didn't have a boss saying, go do this. And so... I would play video games for research, which is a poor way to do research, but it's really fun. <laughs> and so, um, but year over year, I would look at myself and say, okay, well, these are the areas that I think I can improve. And so year two, my goal was 2,500 and then it was 3,000 and all the way up until this year, my goal is 4,500 words a day. Mm -hmm. And I'm averaging it. I'm hitting 4,500 words a day. And so like I pushed myself a little bit more and a little bit more and the 4,500 words a day, I generally do in the, in about five hours a day. Right. And then I spend a couple hours doing my schoolwork and, and pushing my master's forward and then I have family time. And so the first thing, when people ask like, how can you do so much? The first thing I say is I didn't do it all at once. I started at one thing. And the second thing is that I block my time. So instead of multitasking, I focus exclusively on one thing really hard for a brief period of time, like an hour or 45 minutes. Right. And I might do that until a project is done and then move on to another one. And because I stay focused on one thing, I get a lot done. Yeah. Does that make sense? No, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. When you talk about blocking your time, uh, do you use anything like you use just a regular calendar or do you have an app that you prefer or how do you block out your time? Um, I mean, now it's, it's kind of fluid because I'm in the master's program. And so that makes it harder. Um, this semester I have two classes that are close enough together. They're, they're too close for me to come home from campus, but right. too far for me to really get a lot done. And so I end up, I lose like five to six hours. I think it's five hours on Tuesday and five hours on Thursday. So yeah. I'm losing 20% of my work week just in class time, right. right? which is a challenge. And so when I block my time, it stays a little bit fluid, but it's really just like an hour blocks. And I'll say, okay, I need this many blocks to do this work. I need this many blocks to do this. And then I just stay focused during that time on that topic. Okay. Um, okay. It's like a box. It's like a mental box that I just put everything in that I'm going to do during that time. And then I do it. And when I say that they're focused, I mean it. It's not just go to work. Like when I'm writing, that's all I'll do is write. I won't be on Facebook. Right. I, I'll have my outline on one screen. I have two screens. And so an outline on one screen and my bike book on the other. 
Yeah. And I'll write straight for 45 minutes. And when I'm doing like business stuff, that's a block where I answer emails. Um, I respond to questions, uh, that kind of thing. And then I might have a marketing block where I'm just marketing. Right. And so it really allows me to just get focused in and accomplish a great deal in a short period of time. Yeah. Um, I've told people this before, uh, because it's a very similar method to what I use, of course. Um, and I've told people this before that it, it's not about the whole multitasking myth is that you can do, you know, a handful of things at the same time, uh, just rapidly shifting between them all. And what I found was it's a lot like the advice I give to people when it's editing versus writing. Like I tell people, you got to turn off that inner editor while you write because it's two different jobs. Yeah, it's, it's two, two different, different jobs. It's very yeah. accurate. Yeah. So it's the same thing with everything else. Uh, so you're, that whole blocking time thing um, is smart. And uh, I'm not just saying that because I do it. I actually think <laughs> it's... <laughs> it's, it can be pretty powerful. Um, if someone would have told me five years ago that I would write 600,000 words in a year, yeah. I would have laughed in their face. Like it yeah. would have been hilarious to me because yeah. it wasn't even uh, possible. And now it's done. And even though I'm editing a lot this year, I think I'm still going to write four to 500,000 words just by writing for 40, 4,500 words a day. Yeah. I mean, what's really funny about that is once you've done it, um, it, the, it, it becomes something you can do and therefore it's no longer as intimidating. Like, yeah. you know, I can do that. Even if it was difficult to do, uh, even if it, it took, was stressful to do, uh, knowing normal. that you can do it. Yeah. It becomes your new normal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in, in regards to like a, like a boss series, um, that's the key thing is that initially you, you create a goal that seems really distant. This is your, and then you have a mindset that says, I, I can do that and I'm going to do that. And then you build yourself up a layer at a time, a layer at a time. And we go into detail in the books on what layers help and how to push that. But right. you get to that point and suddenly your dream is your reality and you have to come up with a new dream because suddenly you're doing what you thought you would never achieve. And now you're right. doing it. And now your dream is met and you have to dream bigger, which is yeah. a really cool point to be at. Do you, uh, have you read, did you read mindset? Uh, Carol Dweck's uh, book mindset. No, I think you mentioned it to me, and it's on my list, okay. but I haven't okay. had a chance to read it yet. I, I probably have. That's one of those books. I'm a, I, I'm always an advocate of things that I that I think are really useful, um, and that book talk, talks about that sort of thing because you have a growth mindset. Okay, I'm just I a do. spoiler. Here's your spoilers: uh, growth mindset versus fixed mindset. You're definitely a growth mindset in that you get to the uh, that goal that you've achieved, and then you just set the new goal. Whereas some people, if they have a fixed mindset, would get to that goal and they don't know what to do from that point. And that's when they, people start to get depressed. That's when bad things start to happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they do. And th the thing is, is people ask me, like, why did you start a master's degree in writing after you are already a full-time author? Because that you, is something I was about to ask you. Yeah, so. but usually those go in the opposite. And that's, that's a common question that I get is they're like, wait, you're already a full-time author. And... I say because I didn't take many classes in writing in my bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. And so I want, I wasn't always wanting to be a writer. Actually, I hated writing to be honest. I, I hated it. Mm -hmm. And so what, and I was writing full time. I kept saying, I want to do more. I want to be more. And a master's degree was a, was a good progression of that. And so my wife and I looked at things and we'd like to say, there's nothing we don't do better together. And so that's why we decided to each do one together and we studied together and, and things like that. That's but, awesome. Um, the entire degree and it has pushed me. My entire romance series was a kernel of an idea before the program. And now I'm uh, two of them are published and my third is coming out in three days. Uh, yeah. And it's going to be coming out every two weeks for a year, 250,000 words in romance. Yeah. Okay. That, that would be 27 dates yes. that you and I talked about briefly at the, at the conference. Yeah. Uh, typically now, so far you've written mostly fantasy, uh -huh. all right, but this is romance. So yes. you're actually writing in a whole new genre now. So what, yep. <laughs> so give me that story because that's that a lot of people ask about, like they, they want to be able to write multiple genres. So what's your approach to this right now? You're writing on your, a, a pen name. It is a pen name. I mean, it's B N hail <laughs> the initials B N. Okay. So it's, it's not much of a stretch. Yeah. Um, I think that, I mean, this goes to what I was saying that as an author, you always want to be pushing yourself to be more, to be better. Mm -hmm. um, and 
when I started master's program, I'd, I'd written 1.4 million words in fantasy. Um, mm -hmm. Right now it's like 1.9 million. And so I wanted to um, push myself and I took a class that was a creative writing class and it was a critique class where each one would write three short stories in the semester and then you would critique everyone else. Mm -hmm. And there were other assignments, but that was basically it. And so I wrote three totally different genres. Instead of writing fantasy, which is, would have been comfortable and easy and aced it and no, no problems, I wrote a suspense thriller, and then I wrote a comedy, and then I wrote a romance. And I did this because I wanted to get feedback from everyone else. I wanted to see, could my writing style jump to other genres and how would it be received? Yeah. And like the comedy, for example, the comedy was about a guy that gets in trouble at, at college and a friend says, oh, my roommate can help you out. And he goes to this roommate and this roommate is, is uh, he'd lost his scholarship. And so what he does to pay for school is he figured out a way to get into multiple drug trials all at the same time. And so he gets a lot of money from being in multiple drug trials. You're not supposed to do that, but he figured out he's like a brilliant kid. And yeah. so he has a hundred side effects and the side effects are always changing. And so like at one point it allowed him to read minds and another point like it, <laughs> he's like, practically Tourette's and one he's always hot. And so he's always shirtless and super muscular. Now you can do like push-ups like crazy, like just really, really crazy stuff. And so his, um, his side effects and it was called side effects, okay. um, made it possible for him to help this kid get out of his jam and solve the problem because of, because he's straight up nuts. Yeah. And <laughs> writing something like thing that this is way beyond anything I'd ever written but I wanted to try and uh, in the trying is where you find success because yeah. that's what you do is you push yourself, you try something new and sometimes it fails more often than not, it might, but right. then you have things that come out and do exceptionally well because you tried and you tried again and then you try harder and then you try harder and suddenly it's the new normal and it's what you do. Yeah, man, that's your, that's your story. That's just that we could have just done that one line and that would have been pretty much you in a nutshell in this interview. <laughs> well, I mean, I hope that's my legacy for my kids and my family and yeah. um, for friends to inspire them is that, you know, you, you can do things that initially you think you can't. Right. I didn't think I was a writer. I didn't think I was a business person. I thought this wasn't in, in my skill set. Like this was not even a talent. Right. And now it's my career and yeah. it's the best career I can imagine. And it started out as me telling my wife an idea and she saying, you need to write this. And I laughed, literally laughed. Like there's mm -hmm. no possible way that could ever happen. And that was yeah. 10 years ago. And now I have the best career I could ever imagine because yeah, I man. trusted my wife. <laughs> and I just, I, the, one of the things, and you trusted your wife, my, my wife, uh, is just as wonderful. I probably don't listen to her ha half as much as I should, uh, <laughs> but she's almost always right. Um, <clears throat> and they wait until we accept that inevitability and are like, Oh, okay. It took me two months to accept oh, yeah. that. And you're like, okay, I'll try writing. Oh, okay. Took you two months. Okay. Yes. I'm still working on it. We've been, married... waited patiently. <laughs> <laughs> We've been married 12 years. I'm still working on getting to that point where I'm I, I finally accept she knows a thing or two. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, all right, man, you, uh, I don't know. You just, you impress me. Um, and, and you also depress me because. <laughs> no, not. <laughs> Cause you are, uh, you've got this stuff together, man. Uh, what, one of the things I admire about you, um, and I have from the start, uh, it just, every time I meet you, it just grows. You, you look for the challenge. And you dive straight into it and you, you take it on. And even if you don't conquer it, which I have yet to hear of one you didn't conquer, but I mean, even if you don't conquer it, you take everything you can from it and you apply it to everything else in your life, man. That's that right there um, is probably the most inspiring thing I know of any person I've ever met. So I, I, I really appreciate that. that. Um, and I mean, you say that I, I, I do like a challenge. Um, I like it when things test me and force me to rise to the challenge. Yeah. I, I do enjoy that. 
And I know most people don't. When something's hard, they it, it's a wall to them. I, I don't see that as a wall. I see that as a tree to be climbed. Like, yeah. that's like, let's do this. And I, I mean, there's, I mean, like my tree house that I built, I'd never built anything like it. This wood spiral staircase with a pole in the middle. And, and I just, I just like that. It's just something fun for me. But there's a number of things that I haven't quite succeeded at. Um, at one point, I wanted to teach myself to play the piano. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't have anyone around me that could teach me. And so I, I knew how to read music and how to, those attached to the notes. So I already had to start because I'd been in choir, which by the way, I'm not a good singer. Um, if you can't tell from my speaking voice, my choir voice is, you know, less, um, whatever. less admirable. <laughs> but um, I did teach myself to play the piano and I played, you know, five or six songs and then life got away from me and I didn't really get to the point of mastery that I wanted to. Mm -hmm. So I can probably play one song now. <laughs> there's, there's not much to it, but I still want to that challenge of, can I push that? And can I do that? Is, is still there. Yeah. And I, I do, I, I like things that when people say you can't do that, or that's going to be really hard. I think, why, Let, why does it have to be, you know, let's, right. let's go for it. <laughs> yeah. 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 And that's that growth mindset. Um, I think I'm much more of a fixed mindset than you are. Really? I think I can learn anything. Uh, but then I, when I hit those limits, sometimes it, 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 the pushback is a little solid. So I tend to stay in the, uh, the waters that I know I'm where I'm the top fish. I tend you to stay in those waters. <laughs> oh man. That's, it's nice to be the top fish. But. Yeah, but you got to put, you got to get out. I mean, I, I, some of the things I'm most grateful for in my life were when I pushed beyond my comfort zone and, and got into something completely outside of what I ever thought. I used to be very shy, for example, uh, used to be a much bigger introvert. You're, you, we had this discussion at SAS, like I was an introvert who learned the, to be an extrovert. You, you are an extrovert who's very well, who's just reserved. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, but you, so you can grow, you can learn and grow. So I'm not completely a fixed mindset. Is to, is it's, um, out. it is incredible. And I think, I think that was one of my initial abilities. It, what's funny is that when I was, a, I'm at 10 or 12, um, I felt like a talentless geek and <laughs> I felt like I didn't have any talents, any mm -hmm. at all. And I had a conversation with my dad and he said, he said, one day you are going to realize that you have more talents than you can possibly imagine. And my response was, I don't think that'll ever happen. Um, but looking back, I think what I did feel was that I did like a challenge. And when things were hard, I would tackle them and just go at them head on. And I think that pushed me to develop more. And that's how I approached when I learned Portuguese and I lived in Brazil. Mm -hmm. Um, I was there for two years and I learned Portuguese in the first about three to four months. And oh, excellent. I, I tackled it the same thing. I mean, learning a language is hard. It's very hard, Yeah. but I, I approached it the same way. And, and so I think that I didn't start with much, but maybe I gained them <laughs> because I took the challenges as, as what they were at face value and just said, this can be conquered. Yeah. Yeah, man. That's a, uh... If if people listening or watching this take nothing else away from this interview, I, I really hope they take that away. That um, it is about ex just accepting accepting those things that that seem like barriers. I mean, you're a rock climber, right? I do no, like you, rock climbing. you did, yeah. So so that's what that's what you are. Both, you know, that's what you are metaphorically as well. You know, you come yeah, to that I, wall. I mean, I hope other people get that. Like, that's not yeah, just I mean, that's not just like me on a personal level, this is what yeah. I like to do. Anyone, anyone mm -hmm. can look at a barrier that is around them and say to themselves, I can defeat this. Not by breaking it, but by mm -hmm. climbing it, by learning what is required to climb it. Yeah. And it's, it's never easy. In, in my experience, no challenge is ever easy. It's a challenge because it's a big wall, because it blocks you, because it's hard. It could be because your family situation is, is, 
isn't like financially well off and you want to go to college. Yeah. Any wall, that wall can be overcome. Uh, my family had no money whatsoever as a youth. And so the prospect of going to college, I knew from like 10 years old that if I wanted to go to college, I'd pay for it myself. Yeah. And so I just knew that I knew going into that and that was a challenge, but it, it can be overcome. Yeah. And so the perspective, the mindset of I can do this is in my opinion, the greatest attribute that any person can gain a concrete, you know, faith in themselves that I can do this. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, though you, you're, you're in the master's program. You're nearly done with that. I am. Yeah. Uh, I'll finish this year. Um, so what's the next challenge? What's the next, the next mountain you'll be climbing? <laughs> my, my next challenge is time. Um, you're going to conquer I, I, time. You're going to travel through time. Is that, <laughs> is that what you're about to tell me? Yes, Kevin. I'm working on this thing in the basement. Kid, and then when you talk to me now, you're like, oh, I met you 10 years ago. Um, no, I, I want to get to the point that I only work five hours a day. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to be there when my kids get home from school. I want to have lunch with my wife. My wife and I laid out the ideal time of working. Right. <laughs> this was a hilarious conversation because my, the bar that I thought was like the ideal was not even close to what my wife thought the ideal was. And so we agreed on this ideal of what we wanted me to go for. And it's essentially working like uh, five to six hours a day um, with 10 weeks off a year, mm -hmm. just total across all vacation or sick or whatever, just 10 weeks off in a year and all Fridays off like okay. a four day work week. And like initially this is like, this is absurd. There's no possible way that I could maintain my writing schedule and do this. But that thought is immediately followed with, but I bet I could do it. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know course. if I'll get that far. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But in the trying is where you find success. And so I will. You'll get it. I, I yeah, will no, try. And you, it's, you, it's no, you won't just try. Work. I know you by now, Ben. You're, you're <laughs> going to do it. And then, and then a year from now, you're, you're going to come back on the show and tell me how you're only working four days a week, five <laughs> hours a day. And then Not you're going to say, there's no way I recognize that it won't be a year, maybe no, no. four years, five years. That's my five year goal. No, no. I, all right. Whatever. I'll take that. I'll take that bet. You'll I'll take, take it. Uh, cause, cause well, I, first of all, cause I happen to know that that's not impossible. Like I've had that circumstance. I, my problem is I, I get there and then I decide, well, now I've got like three or four hours a day that I could fill with something else if I really wanted to. And then I start doing something else. Now I've got Fridays off. I could just, you know, I'll produce a podcast every Friday. <laughs> That's what I do. So, um, but you're better at, you're better at uh, selling yourself no than I am though. Um, it, it's hard. I mean, yeah. one of the prospects that, I mean, like last year, to be honest, I was working hard and in my master's degree and last May, I think is when Honoré and I got to really talking seriously about write like a boss. I didn't have yeah. time to add 50,000 words in an editing schedule to my time, but I wanted to do it. And so I, I filled it in. I couldn't say no, even though my schedule was already full. And so yeah. I squeezed it. I squeezed an hour out of days that I didn't have an hour. And some days that meant I had to work a little bit late. And some days that meant I didn't get other things that I wanted. But um, right. some, sometimes we say our priority is family and our priority is time with them, but we choose Otherwise, we make choices yeah. that are contrary to that. And with how many kids I have specifically, one-on-one uh, -on -one time with them is, is a massive priority. Time with them is a priority. And what we need to understand as human beings is that time is our most precious commodity. It's, yeah. not, it's not money. It's not um, building resources. It's not our home. It's not our car. It is, it is time. And so right. how we spend our time is going to change our, our whole life. Yeah. And so I want my kids when they leave my home, I could earn more money. If I wrote more like this year, I could probably write 800,000 words and next year go for a million in a year. But when my kids leave the house, I want them to remember their entire 18 years of time with their dad. Yeah. And that's, that's worth more than any amount of money that I could earn. Yeah. 
Yeah. I, I, if it, well, yeah. One more reason to admire you, dude. Um, <laughs> as if you needed another. Uh, well, I, and I want to say, like, I appreciate that. <laughs> And I really do. It makes me feel good. I'm very, very grateful. I don't no, see that, it in myself. No, no. Well, uh, but I reason, really, I am really grateful for that. And I'm not trying. I'm not saying that to butter you up in any way. I just I'm feeling butter. What? What? You, you should feel buttered. You're gonna good. be toasty brown by the time you're ready to turn. <laughs> I'm ready to turn. But <laughs> what I love about it, I mean, it's just that. It's just that. Writing is such an interesting business, and we do tend. We tend to be solitary. We we tend to cloister ourselves off. We don't think about, uh, I loved Stephen King said that, you know, right with the door open, you know, uh, meaning your life doesn't take a back seat to the work. The work needs to be a part of the life. You've managed to do that on a grander scale than most authors ever think about. And, but it's inspirational because so many authors out there struggle with the idea of how do I balance my my family, my job, you know, my day job, if you have one, school, if you're going to school, I want to balance all that and still work toward this dream. Uh, and you're, you're saying it's possible. You're not only saying it's possible, you, you're demonstrating it's possible. And that is admirable. Um, and I, it's inspirational. And I, that's one of the reasons I wanted you on the show is because I, I talk to so many authors. You know, I'm getting passionate. Sorry. It's and okay. Take I it over. It's, it's your interview, but I'm taking over. You're fine. I, I get so I, nobody fully appreciates how much I actually love this community and how much I want to see them succeed. And so talking to someone like you is, um, is all meant to help that person who, who that mother or that single father or whoever it is that's sitting out there right now who is struggling with, I'm just trying to pay the bills and keep my life in balance, but I have this dream. Uh, I want them to know that you are out there. And that you, you know, you've done it and you've created resources that can help them do the same thing. So, uh, I appreciate that about you, man. I, I just can't tell you enough. So, well, I mean, to anyone that's listening, I, I want you to understand that I started from a point where I was a non-writer. Um, I had four kids. I had a small business at home that demanded a lot of time and, and my family depended on me. I mean, the circumstances were probably below zero. And if I am able to do that from there to where I am now, you totally can. If you have a dream, if you like to write, you're already better off than I started. If you've written a thousand words, you're better off than where I started. And so anything that you want, you can have. You can go after it. You can achieve it. You can earn it. You can make it happen. You can create it. You can forge a future that you want. Yeah. And right now where I'm sitting now, there's a future that I want and I'm going to go after it and I'm going to forge it. I'm, I'm not going to wait for it. I'm not going to expect it to come to me because I deserve it. The truth is everybody deserves a great future. Everyone does. It's not a question of deserving it. It's a question of, are you willing to make it happen? Are you willing to learn your way into the future that you want? Right. Don't get me wrong. It can be hard. I know a lot of people wants to hear, oh, what's the one secret? There isn't a secret. The secret is that you learn and you push yourself and you say, I can do this. When you don't think it, when you're tired, when you're exhausted, when your kids are screaming and, and life is crazy. My first office was in a corner of my master bedroom and my kids would come in and say, daddy, come play with me. It's hard. It is very, very, very hard. But right. that doesn't mean that it isn't awesome. And it is incredible. And it is just so amazing when you feel that sense of triumph that you've overcome something that was the hardest thing you've ever done. And you look back and you say, I am here because I made it happen. I created my future. I built it. It is mine. And I did it. That is amazing. And you get to that moment and your next thought will be what's next. Yeah. Because you created that mindset of, I'm going to move forward. I'm going to create, I am capable of doing this. So don't ever look at yourself and think I can't do that. Please, please don't compare it to what I've done this last year to what you're doing now and think that's impossible. Compare yourself to my first year with your first year. And you're going to say, wow, I'm doing way better than him. Yes. Yes, you are. That's good. That is awesome. 
You right. can't do it. Never, ever question your ability. And on that note, man, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap up. I think I took you a little over what I told you I would, but, um, that's okay. We're, we both got passionate at the end. I know, man. We'll do, <laughs> that's the danger. That's the danger of me talking to people that I respect and admire, um, which is why I do the show in the first place, but, uh, I can keep going forever. Um, tell people where they can find you online. So my fantasy books are under luminea.com which is a little hard to spell. So just search Ben Hale. Um, Lumine is usually in the top couple of, of sites. That's my fantasy series. Um, there's 19 books in it and it's five series all interconnected into a massive, massive world. Um, it's huge. Uh, tons of fun to write, lots of planning. Um, if you go to Amazon and search Ben Hale, you'll find my 19 books there. Uh, the nonfiction ones, uh, just go to Amazon and it's uh, write like a boss. That's the easiest way to search for that. Um, they're not sequential. So you can pick the one that you want to read. My mm -hmm. personal favorite is write like a boss, but you can pick whichever, you know, is the one you need at the moment. Um, my third one is titled 27 Dates. It's a clean romance where each uh, short story is one date. And so it's a guy and a girl that it's a dating challenge who can plan the better date. And it gets really creative and really adventurous and, and really fun. Um, also on Amazon, uh, that's wide release, so you can find it anywhere. And uh, that website is 27dates.com. So, uh, wow. my three pen names at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, uh, you can find links to all this in the show notes if you go tune in on uh, wordslingerpodcast.com. Uh, or if you're watching on YouTube, it'll probably be in the show notes of this episode right below you. So, uh, Ben, man, I appreciate you, uh, hanging out with me for, for this, uh, this time. Uh, always, as always, man, every time I talk to you, I walk away inspired. So God Thanks. bless you, brother. I really appreciate what you do for the community, uh, the, and what you represent. So, thank you. Really appreciate it. Everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, right now you're probably hearing the groovy bridge music and you may dance in place at will. Uh, I'm going to hang out with Ben just a few minutes longer, but uh, I'll see you on the other side with industry news and some other cool stuff. So see you there. Hear your book the way it was meant to be heard with a fully custom soundtrack based on your material, an album of music that perfectly fits your characters, your settings. Hear your book today. SonataInscribe.com. Welcome back. Thanks for sticking around through that interview with Ben Hale. Hope you got something useful out of that. Now, if you're an author trying to balance a whole bunch of different stuff in your life with your writing career, uh, I can't think of anyone who's more inspirational and more of a guide than Ben Hale. So uh, make sure you're checking out his stuff. Check out his work. Check out Write Like a Boss, uh, which is co-authored with my good friend and former multiple episode show guest, uh, Honoré Quarter. You're going to want to take a look at that. You can find links to the book, to everything else that you are interested in, in the show notes of this episode. If you're on YouTube, just look down below you. Take a look right down below you. And uh, if you're listening on the audio podcast, you can surf on over to uh, wordslingerpodcast.com where you can find show notes, uh, back episodes, um, other video, you know, videos and things that you may not have known were there. There's a whole bunch of cool stuff going on over at uh, wordslingerpodcast.com. If, if you ever wanted to see what a wordslinger looked like while he was recording an episode, this is your chance. This is the first time in history. <laughs> you get it warts and all. I hope, you, I hope this is okay. Please, um, for me, let me know. Surf on over to wordslingerpodcast.com, hit the contact button, and while you're there, leave me a note. Tell me what you're getting out of the show. Tell me what uh, what sorts of things that uh, you've observed have, have been working, what's not working. You know, this kind of feedback helps. I can't promise I'll make any changes to the show based on what you send me, but um, I might. <laughs> I just might. Um, but uh, I hope you're getting something cool out of it. So let me know. And um, while you're there, there's all kinds of cool stuff on the site you can check out. Of course, my books, that sort of thing. Uh, so make sure you, you sort of snoop around. That's my lair. That's where I hang out. Um, now, I'm going to get into industry news. And uh, I think you'll dig some of what's got what's come up here first up is vellum adds easier import from scrivener now if you are uh if you're not aware of what vellum is vellum is a uh it's a piece of layout software that you can use to convert your manuscript 
from a, uh, a Word document or an RTF document to um, an ebook format, <clears throat> basically every ebook format, and uh, including PDFs and uh, a print format. Now that's something they've added in, in the past year. Um, so you can get a print ready um, PDF from that book. Now, if that sounds familiar, it's because the uh, Draft to Digital offers those same services. Uh, for free now uh, vellum is not free you have to pay a couple hundred bucks to get this software uh, but it does do a beautiful job I will confess I use vellum for my stuff I use vellum to uh, to lay out my ebooks and my uh, print books and mostly because I had already purchased vellum before draft to digital added uh, the print feature and I'd, I'd been using it for for years frankly so um, but now it has the this import from Scrivener. Now, Scrivener, of course, is one of the most popular writing programs on the planet. Um, just about every author I know, if they don't love Scrivener, uh, they've at least tried it. Now, I know quite a few who don't love it. <laughs> and one, one in particular is Justin Sloan. Uh, sorry to call you out, Justin, but he does not like Scrivener. So he sticks to Word, and that's, uh, that's okay by him and okay by me. But now... Um, Vellum is ha has now added uh, this uh, ability to import a lot easier from Scrivener. You can uh, from Scrivener you can spit out you know various formats, um, and you can actually do ebook formats from from Scrivener. You don't necessarily have to use Vellum to do an ebook layout, but uh, what you get with Vellum is a, a lot a lot cleaner uh, layout, a lot cleaner style. Um, it's very cool. Yeah, I, I dig it. And, uh, and for me, um, I would just spit this out and this is what they're recommending as well. You spit it out as a word document instead of trying to use Scrivener for your, um, ebook layout, spit your book, your book guy. Maybe I shouldn't say it that way. Export, compile, compile your book as, <laughs> as a, uh, word format. And then you can easily import everything into vellum. And what they're doing is, um, they're using so now they've got the import feature, but it's now supporting a lot of uh, Scrivener's formatting options. Um, so you know you don't have to go through and, and manually reformat. Um, so that's that's good news. So that's a pretty cool one. Thought I'd share that. Now, if you are interested in that story, you want to read more about that, uh, surf on over. You can go check that out on the uh, in the show notes. There's a, there will be a link, but I've also uh, created a bit.ly link, even though bit.ly links have apparently set some people off, <laughs> but you can find that under the heading vellum adds easier import from Scrivener and that'll be bit.ly slash 152 dash vellum. You can find that whole story. Uh, that's on their blog. So, uh, go check that out next up. Um, this is an interesting story. Uh, I actually went through this. The Authors Guild is taking its annual author income survey. Uh, now, this is an important thing. I, I don't. I know that there's a lot of um, there are a lot of people out there who just don't. They don't care about this kind of stuff, and I, I get it. Um, what is interesting is we we're constantly getting the message from traditional publishing uh, that you know uh, there are no authors out there making a living from self-published books that that those who are making a living are unicorns <laughs> and now of course they define make a living sometimes as how many how many um bmws and mercedes can you fit in your you know 20 car garage um that's not the kind of living i think most people think about most people think can i pay my bills can i buy food uh for my uh family can i you know can i make my car note can i you know can my existence be sustained by uh, my author income? And the answer is it can. Now, here's the deal. Um, this uh, The Authors Guild, it does this annual survey, and it's important that we reach out and do this. Uh, if we if we as indie authors take this, uh, and it is it, it does have a self-publishing segment, right? Um, it is it, it does include self-published authors. Uh, if we do this, then the industry gets more accurate information about what authors are doing, how they're making a living, or, or whether or not they're making a living, what their income levels are, um, where they're selling, what, what types of books they're selling. There's all kinds of interesting questions in this thing. Now, I went through it, took the whole thing, and I recommend you do too. If you're an indie author, go, uh, go check this out. Now, the survey, um, you can only take it once. It, check, it, it does a... Uh, puts a cookie on your your uh hard drive and you know make sure that you're not 
double dipping. Um, but you can, uh, you should be able to take it from this link. I, I shortened the link to uh, bit.ly slash 152 dash income. Uh, you'll find that under the heading, the Authors Guild is taking its annual author income survey in either uh, YouTube's uh, show notes or on the show notes on wordslingerpodcast.com. Go check that out. Bitly slash 152 dash income. Take that survey. Go go take that survey and let the industry, let, let everyone know uh, what you're making and how you're managing your career uh, because these things can help with decisions down the road. This can help with... Um, you know, whether or not someone decides to create new services, for example, if they find that there's a market for it, they'll create, they may create something you need. So little things like that is very important. So go, go check that out. Our third and final story is Amazon now lets authors purchase multiple copies of Kindle eBooks. Uh, this is a good one. It's coming in from the digital reader, uh, website. And, uh, I, what's interesting about it is that, you know, it's the first time that basically authors have been allowed to purchase multiple copies of their own book for use in giveaways, arcs, that sort of thing. Uh, in the past, you've always had to do something fancy. You've had to use a third party service. Uh, but now you can do this directly from Amazon. Uh, I think that's cool. Uh, and I'll read a little bit here. Now Amazon enables you to purchase multiple copies of your ebook in a single order as an author, a great way to build your brand is to run social media giveaways, gift your ebooks to readers at a conference, and or send an ebook to your newsletter subscribers. When you purchase multiple copies of a Kindle book on Amazon, we create a set of redemption links, one for each copy of the ebook. You can distribute these links to any reader on Amazon to get the to get started, find an ebook, choose buy for others. And select the quantity of ebooks you'd like to purchase, and you can find more on their help page. Um, so now I, I'm I'm guessing that this isn't just for authors. I'm uh, in the past when Amazon has set up things like you know you can give away practically anything um, through their service. Uh, let's just say you offer to give away a um, I don't know a laptop or an iPad to uh, a lucky reader, you know who. Uh, who answers a question correctly, you know, or, or something along those lines, or you enter, uh, everyone who gets on your mailing list is entered into a drawing to receive a free iPad. So they've had a system in place to do this sort of thing for a while. Now though, they're applying it to digital product and they're allowing you to buy multiple copies. Here is the inevitable downside. <laughs> they're not giving you any discounts on this. You're not getting, this isn't a, uh, an author's rate kind of thing. You're paying full retail. So whatever your cover price is set at, uh, you're buying copies of the book at that price. Now, uh, we could get a little sneaky. I don't know if this will work. I don't know if it's against their uh, terms of service or anything like that. So you're going to have to check. You don't, don't follow advice from me blindly. Go check and make sure that the terms of service do not disallow things like this. But here's an idea. Um, if you set up a, uh, a, a Kindle countdown or, or something like that for a, uh, another promotion, or if you want to lower your book price for a time, um, I don't see any reason why you couldn't take advantage of the multi-copy purchase while that price is very low. So set your price at 99 cents, for example, and, uh, buy a hundred copies. And, uh, now there may be limits on how long you can hold those copies. I'm not sure. I don't see why there could be. I mean, honestly, um, but uh, it's, a, it's a way that you might be able to, you know, stock up on a whole bunch of copies. So the next time you're going to run a promotion, let's say you got a book bub or something like that, uh, and you're going to, maybe you run the book for free? There's an idea. Buy, buy multiple copies while it's free. <laughs> so, don't know. And, of course, it's never a good idea to try to cheat the system when it comes to Amazon. Uh, but when it comes to making purchases, I mean, we're going to follow the rules, right? Uh, and the rules are if the book is 99 cents or free and we're able to buy multiple copies of it, you know, it would be the same limitation as if we were buying something, um, anything else on the site that's on sale. Um, I can buy, a, you know, 100 print copies of a book if it's on sale. So there's no limitation there. Uh, theoretically, hypothetically, who knows? Uh, maybe, maybe there are limits that I'm not aware of. If you know anything about that, let me know. Um, fill me in. I'd be happy to. I'd be absolutely happy to to uh, be 
you know, shown how dense and wrong I am. <laughs> so, uh, if you want to follow this story, uh, it's, it is on the, uh, on, uh, Nate Hoff, Hoffelder's, uh, well, great guy, by the way, Nate Hoffelder's, um, digital reader website blog. Um, go check that out. You can find it under the heading in the show notes. Uh, sorry, missed it. Amazon now lets authors purchase multiple copies to Kindle of Kindle eBooks. You can find that at 152-Amazon. Bitly slash 152-Amazon. That is it for uh, this week's Wordslinger podcast. I know it's been a little different. You probably, I don't know if you're distracted by all the, uh, if you're watching the video, you may be distracted by all my like, you know, Sniffing, touching my nose, and uh, <laughs> rubbing my eye, and scratching my head, whatever. Um, but you know what? Um, I'd rather ha- get you the content and then uh, and get you get it to you as quickly and easily as possible uh, than spend hours trying to get it perfect and then you, you know, we all end up missing out on something. So there's where we are. If you like it, uh, give me a thumbs up. If you are on YouTube, uh, please hit the subscribe button, hit the notification icon. I think you got to hit it twice. If you want to be alerted every time the, uh, wordslinger podcast goes live on YouTube. If you are following me on the audio version of the show, definitely, uh, scoot on over to iTunes and find the show wordslinger podcast. Just do a search. Uh, make sure you rate and rank the show hit, hit four or five stars and write a little something in there that tells other people the value you get out of the Wordslinger podcast. Do the same thing in the comments here below on YouTube. Tell people what you get out of it. Ask me a question. Um, I'm trying to figure out a way to, to be alerted. I know there's a, there is an alert, but because I manage multiple YouTube channels, I never see alerts for Wordslinger podcasts. So I'm going to try to get better about that. I'll, maybe I'll set, set up a schedule. If you got suggestions, um, let me know. Uh, best way to reach me, of course, is head on over to wordslingerpodcast.com and hit that contact button. That's a good way to reach me. So thank you so much for tuning in to the Wordslinger Podcast. Uh, I love all of you. I'm glad that you are uh, sticking around. Let me know, of course, uh, what I'm doing right, what I'm doing wrong. And uh, God bless each and every one of you. I'll see you all next week. Hey, thanks for tuning in to the Wordslinger Podcast. Now, you can support this show by visiting wordslingerpodcast.com. That's where you're going to find back episodes, books by me, and links to anything and everything Wordslinger. And be sure to subscribe to this show on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, and anywhere else fine podcasts are sold. I'm Kevin Tomlinson. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. Wordslinger.